We've been talking about digital audio for a while now. We've talked about sampling, quantization, and several nuanced topics along the way, all in isolation, all hinting at a topic in the future where they may be combined together to get a form of audio in the digital domain that can be transmitted and stored and used in the real world. This is that topic, the final piece that lets us piece together all these digital transformations. The final piece is encoding, a way of digitally representing sampled and quantized data. The title of this video is Pulse Code Modulation, and pulse code modulation is a specific type of encoding strategy. The reason why we are talking about pulse code modulation, or PCM, specifically is because it's the most common encoding scheme in use, the easiest to understand, and a classical method that's been around since the dawn of digital audio. I'll have you note that there are several different alternative encoding schemes, with benefits and drawbacks of their own, and we'll describe a few here and go over them in more detail in future videos. But we'll start from scratch and build up to why PCM is a viable encoding strategy. You've all heard of FM before in the context of radio transmission. FM is frequency modulation. Let's say you have a piece of music or speech and you want to transmit it wirelessly across large distances. You'll find that doing this directly, transmitting the audio signal directly, is very limiting. You won't get very far. For starters, the audio band between 20 Hz and 20 kHz just doesn't have enough power and would need a lot of amplification to be transmitted even short distances. And if you receive it on the other side and try to play it back, it'll turn out to be very noisy, since there's a lot of natural and man-made interference in the atmosphere. Engineers found ways of storing and encoding music or speech in unique ways, and frequency modulation is one of these ways. We start with a really high frequency carrier wave, which is going to carry our music, which is going to be encoded within it. We modulate the frequency parameter of this carrier wave corresponding to the instantaneous changes in amplitude in the music signal. Essentially, the change in amplitude of the music is encoded as change in frequency within the carrier. The carrier signal has loads of advantages during transmission. Since it has a very high base frequency, it has a lot of energy and can be transmitted larger distances with little amplification. And since the music is encoded within the frequency of the carrier, and since interference noise only affects the amplitude, the underlying music is unaffected by environmental noise. Once we receive the carrier signal, however, it can't directly be played back. The carrier signal would need to be reverse engineered and demodulated to extract the music signal from it. All of what I described here happens purely in the analog domain. There are no digital signals here, nor any digital processes. So why did I talk about frequency modulation here? I talked about it because the concept of modulation and encoding are transferable concepts and can be used in the digital domain. Modulation is simply a means of encoding information for purposes such as transmission or storage. Here, instead of modulating the frequency, we could just as easily have modulated the amplitude of the carrier wave or the phase. And in fact, these are legitimate encoding schemes, amplitude modulation and phase modulation. They come with their own set of advantages and disadvantages. But all that matters is the underlying music and the use case that determines which type of modulation to use. There may be several different encoding schemes, but they all have a singular purpose, to transmit and store the underlying music as faithfully as possible without any changes to the original. Frequency modulation, as mentioned before, applies to continuous analog signals. For the transmission and storage of discrete digital signals, we need a different approach. Let's take this sinusoid, for instance, in its analog form. To begin the process of transformation from analog to digital, we need the prerequisites, sampling and quantization. Enough has been said about these two processes already, so to sum them up, sampling is simply the process of chopping the signal along the time axis at equal intervals of time. We are only interested in the signal's instantaneous amplitude at these specific intervals. 
Quantization, on the other hand, is simply the process of placing a limit on the number of possible discrete values that the amplitude level can take on. As an example, let's say that this analog signal is now sampled at 44.1 kHz and quantized at a bit depth of 16 bits, or 65,536 discrete levels. The hard part is done. Now the challenge is, how do we represent these sampled values as a signal that can be transmitted along a channel or saved onto a disk? How do we represent this signal so that when we pass it down to another system, say a digital to analog converter, it would have to have the blueprint to recreate the original analog signal exactly? We could make use of pulses. Pulses are precise time-controlled electrical signals. The timing of these electrical pulses are controlled by a very accurate clock, usually a precisely cut piezoelectric crystal. These pulses can be modulated according to the amplitude value of each sampling interval. Pulse width modulation is an encoding technique where the width of the pulse is determined by the amplitude of the sample. So at each sampling interval, a pulse is triggered with a width correspondingly as large as the amplitude of the sample. The larger the amplitude, the larger the width of the pulse. Another modulation technique which is quite similar is pulse position modulation, where a sharp pulse is triggered at the start of the sampling interval and a secondary pulse is triggered at a position which corresponds to the relative amplitude of the sample. So in this case, the larger the sample amplitude, the further away is the secondary pulse from the initial pulse. Quite simple so far, right? Each sample is represented as a single pulse with pulse width modulation and as two pulses with pulse position modulation. Fair enough. But how can this encoded signal be demodulated? How do we take these series of pulses and determine the sample amplitude from it? All we have is relative width or relative position to determine the sample amplitude. We need a high enough resolution to represent the 16-bit sample amplitude correctly. And to represent it perfectly, we need 65,536 distinct clock cycles between each sampling interval. This is an incredibly inefficient way of encoding data, and the bandwidth required to transmit this encoded signal would be colossal. Not only that, but since this type of modulation results in long periods of inactivity or long periods where the pulse is present, a simple uncorrected error in the transmission channel or in the receiving side could result in large deviations from the expected results. Simply put, long chains of zeros or ones could result in large errors. Another type of modulation is pulse amplitude modulation. Again, quite simple, we modulate the amplitude of the pulse corresponding to the amplitude of the audio sample. Only in the most ideal circumstances would this type of modulation even work. If you were to transmit this signal through a channel, noise could easily creep in. Since noise affects the amplitude of a signal, modulating the amplitude parameter of the pulse itself isn't a great idea for transmission. So here's a lesson for us from pulse amplitude modulation. A well-modulated signal has to be unaffected by amplitude changes. Take the pulse width modulated signal for example. No matter how much noise enters the signal, no matter how badly disintegrated the signal is on the demodulating end, just the presence or absence of the pulse is enough to distinguish between different amplitude values. We only need to care about the precise position of the pulse, and we don't need to worry about its precise amplitude. Just detecting whether a pulse is present or not is more than enough. The big problem we saw when dealing with pulse width modulation was the massive resolution needed. But each sample amplitude can actually be expressed as a 16-bit binary number. What if we could encode the binary number itself as a series of pulses? That's precisely what pulse code modulation does. Each sample value is encoded as a binary number with the presence of a pulse treated as a 1 and the absence of it treated as 0. This becomes a very viable strategy since we only need a resolution of 16 clock cycles between two sampling intervals to represent a 16-bit quantized audio signal. We can easily calculate how much bandwidth a PCM encoded signal would occupy. 
bandwidth for digital signals and transmission media is measured in bit rate or information rate and determining bandwidth is quite essential during transmission because a transmission channel such as a digital cable has a limited bit rate that it can accept and the bit rate of our encoded signal needs to be lower than that bit rate is essentially calculated by how many bits are conveyed in one second of time in our particular example, there are 44,100 samples in one second, and the resolution of each sample is 16 bits. So simple math, 44,100 times 16, which is 705,600 bits per second, or 705.6 kilobits per second for a single channel of audio. So the general formula is just sample rate times the bit depth times the number of channels. PCM is great because it bundles up all the information that our electronic component spits out and leaves nothing behind. It represents data in the digital domain as truly as physically possible based on the electronic components chosen for the job of analog to digital conversion. And that's the reason why PCM encoded signals are said to be lossless in nature. That's all great, but it still occupies a lot of damn bandwidth and the core aim of many encoding schemes that came after it was to reduce the bitrate while still maintaining as much information as possible. That was a lot of exhausting theory. But let's just zoom out for a little bit. So far in this module, everything we've talked about is regarding the process of converting a continuous analog signal into a PCM encoded digital signal. We discovered that this analog to digital conversion process, which was once described as a tiny black box in a diagram, has a lot of working parts and pieces that come together and make this happen. Some pieces here might be familiar to you from our earlier discussion, and some may not. You don't need to know everything there is to analog to digital conversion, but just having a working knowledge of it never hurts anybody. So in the next video, we'll briefly go through a few of the blocks here that I haven't covered yet, such as multiplexing, error correction, channel coding, and record modulation. And then, we can finally think about wrapping up this module. See you in the next one.